manager here at Crutchfield and this is Crutchfield Live. This is our ninth episode. We've been running strong here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, many of you already know that. I've been waiting for this feed to start. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are live on YouTube and we are live on Facebook and I am joined today by one of our newest employees at Crutchfield. This is River. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Happy to be here. Excellent. You're not nervous are you? No, no, no. I didn't think so. Excellent. Uh, she is here uh, because uh, as one of our newest employees in our training uh, department, uh, we've been spending the last, what is it? We're in week eight now, right? Week eight, yep. It's week eight, uh, we've been doing training on car products, and uh, she's going to be taking some calls, like next week, your first calls. Yep. That If you're not nervous today, that might be the I time. I will be nervous then. That's a, totally okay. Uh, but she's here mainly because uh, last Friday uh, we did an install day. So part of our training is to get hands-on and we were going to talk to River about her experience installing some pretty nice speakers in her Toyota Corolla, what that experience was like. That's one of our main topics today. Uh, and we've got two other topics as well. We're going to also uh, have Ned and Zach uh, from our creative and our video team. Uh, they recently got some time with some Leica cameras and uh, they're going to talk all about them. So they've got a lot to say. They're into photography and and these are some pretty nice cameras. So uh, they've got a lot to share with you about that. Uh, and we've also got a pretty cool uh, uh, Bowers and Wilkins promotion to talk about, as well as a pretty neat bl uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi speaker, the Zeppelin. You got a chance to hear the Zeppelin, right? I did, yes. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. I'll get your thoughts on that here in just a minute. Uh, so those are the three main topics today, uh, and we've already had some comments come in even before we went live on Facebook. Jeffrey Roy said, you're losing me with all this car crap. Uh, he saw the title of our Facebook post, which was uh, Crutchfield Live Advisor Car Install Training Leica Cameras and ba uh, Bowers and Wilkins Speakers. And apparently car stuff is not his bag. So uh, I do want you to know if you're, if you're giving us a, a chance anyway, Jeffrey Roy, then we are gonna talk about something other than car audio. Uh, so hopefully you stick around for that. Uh, over on YouTube on our community post, uh, a comment came in a day ago uh, from Summer BRZ. Sorry, I'm going to miss it. I'll be drilling an oil well in my backyard. 
Well, I wish. Instead, I'll just be at work. Uh, I feel you there, man. With the prices at the gas pumps, I don't blame you one bit uh, for that at all. Uh, Tony on Facebook says, hello from Maryland. Where are you guys? That's an easy one to answer. You want to tell them where we are? We are in Charlottesville. Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, so not all that far from Maryland. I grew up in Northern Virginia, also known as the DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So uh, I'm curious, Tony, where in Maryland are you? Because you might just be uh, a few hours drive from us. We have two retail stores here in Virginia, one right here in Charlottesville, the other one in Harrisonburg. And depending on where you're coming from in Maryland uh, might determine which of those is closer to you. On YouTube, Steve Mann says, uh, testing one, two, three, checking out the show from Ontario, Canada. Hello, everybody. How are you? Right on. We are going worldwide now. We are international. It's awesome. Are you excited? Very you ever excited. Been to, you ever been to Canada? I've been very close to Canada. I've close. Been to Canada. Yeah? Yeah. I've been to Canada twice. I went to Banff to go skiing for a couple of weeks. That was awesome. And I went to Niagara Falls. I mainly stayed on the American side, but I did cross over to see the fireworks on the Canada side at Niagara Falls, which I highly recommend if you haven't done that. That's where I was. Check that out, it was pretty cool, yeah, right? Yeah, Niagara Falls is amazing. Uh, so great, uh, glad we've got some people watching. We would love to answer any and all questions you might have for us here at Crutchfield, hopefully Crutchfield related stuff, but you know, Ask us anything. We'll see what we can do with it. Uh, and uh, if we can't get to your question live on the show, we do look at this stuff later on. We will answer your questions in the comments if we can't answer it live, but we would prefer to answer it live. So let us know what you're thinking about. If you're looking to install something in your car, get some speakers for your home, what drone do you want? I mean, we can, we can deal with all of that stuff. So uh, we are here to interact and have fun and hang out with you, our viewers. Um, we also have a poll question today, and it's going to have a lot to do with what we're going to be talking to River about, uh, which is how willing are you to install your own car stereo or car speakers? And uh, we've got four choices on answers there. Uh, how willing are you to install your own car stereo or car speakers? Uh, answer one, never done it before, but I'm willing to give it a try. And if you're that person, cool, we're probably here to help you. Uh, we are very, very helpful to the do-it-yourselfers, even the ones that are novices that have never done installs before, we can help. So that's a good place to be. Uh, maybe you're the type that says, no problem, I've installed stuff before, so not scary to you at all. Or maybe it's, uh, no way, not for me, I'll take it to a professional. Totally fine there as well. And last but not least, a lot of people just have that friend who knows what they're doing uh, in car stereo installation and they get their buddy to come over and they buy them some beer and they do an install. Uh, and so I'm curious uh, of uh, those of you watching, which one of those uh, sounds like you? We will go back to the answers to that poll question here in a few minutes. Um, also, uh, you should know that Crutchfield Live, we are repurposing these into Crutchfield the podcast and sort of so just an audio only version of past Crutchfield Lives will be, they're coming out every other week or so, uh, starting here pretty soon. Uh, on Crutchfield, the podcast. So go to crutchfield.com slash podcast uh, for the latest episodes. We have been hard at work on season three of the podcast. So it's not all just repurposed live shows uh, made to podcasts. We are also doing uh, podcast only interviews of some of our coolest employees and finding out what gear they loved so much they bought it. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what we're doing today. And we're going to start by really diving into uh, River's experience installing stuff in your car. Um, so let's start off with, uh, I wanna know, did you have like any previous installation experience? Have you worked on cars? What's your, what's your level of comfort getting dirty in, you know, taking cars apart and stuff? I don't have any experience with Zero. installing audio equipment. I've been around cars. I've worked for a couple of years at a mechanic shop, so totally fine with the getting down dirty, the tools, all of that, um, but the actual getting into audio equipment, zero. So you've done mechanical work on cars, but never dealing with the yeah, audio been, and the electrical. Yeah, I've been around that stuff, uh, not a whole lot on my own, so doing the actual uh, work of installing audio equipment was very new for me. So, I mean, some people are just never have never been around being taking a car apart yeah. right um that's that concept wasn't new to you no uh and so when it came time uh, a few weeks ago to decide 
what you might install in your car to take advantage of this, you know, it's a paid opportunity to, yeah. get, you're getting paid to install <laughs> stuff in your car in an effort to learn what that's like so that you can yeah. help our customers. Um, how did you decide and what, uh, what did you decide to install into your car? Well, I knew I wanted new speakers. Uh, my speakers are, they were just factory speakers. So of course I wanted to upgrade there. Um, and then there was kind of some, sound like they were starting to blow. So mm -hmm. definitely need some new speakers. Um, I was going to tackle that and maybe replace my less than ideal sub and amp that I have going on in my car. So yeah. that, that was the goal was the speakers, the sub and amp. But So you have factory speakers in there up until Friday. Yes. Uh, factory radio or had that already been replaced? I did replace it. It is an aftermarket radio. Did you install the stereo yourself or did that? No, somebody else did that. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, it was a shop. So. Uh, and uh, somebody else also installed this monstrosity of a subwoofer in yes. your trunk. Uh, you had told us about it in training, but when we actually opened your trunk and saw that thing, it was a ginormous, uh, what looked to be made out of plywood box yes. uh, with a massive subwoofer and an amplifier and some kind of skimpy power wires. I mean, it was not the cleanest install we'd ever seen. We were very happy to know that somebody else did that, not you. Yeah, it was quite the entertainment of, of the day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, it, how does it sound? I mean, you got bass in the car at least, right? Yeah, I mean, right? There's, there's, the bass is good. There's plenty of bass, but it's it's not what I want in my car, knowing what I know now working here. <laughs> you, you have zero room to put anything else in that trunk, basically. Yeah, I had uh, maybe a couple like little things rolling around back there, but as far as groceries or hauling anything, that wasn't happening. Right. Yeah. yeah, you can't fit anything of substantial size in there. Uh, real quick, going back to Tony, he's in Pikesville, Maryland. Uh, maybe somebody can help me out with some geography. I don't know exactly where that is. Which store is closer to Tony in Pikesville, Maryland? Uh, he also says, are we in post-COVID as it pertains to availability and shipping? Yikes. Uh, that's a great question. We're not quite back to normal when it comes to availability and shipping. Uh, COVID, COVID got things started. Everybody was super interested in, uh, you know, they were all staying home and buying stuff. And so we sold a lot of stuff and then we were out of a lot of stuff uh, because of that. And then the shipping uh, issues, uh, you know, so f what, the shipping crisis mm -hmm. basically of the last year or so, uh, that made it only worse. But I would say definitely things seem to be on the upswing. Um, we are getting emails couple times a week, hey, look, we've got more home theater receivers in stock. We've got more car stereos in stock. We just got a new shipment from Pioneer, things like that. So uh, I would say things are looking up. Uh, certainly if when I look through all the stuff and I click on what's in stock, I, I wish there was more there. So we're not back to where we want to be. You know, we've always done a really nice job of keeping everything in stock, but it's been really tough here lately. So we're not quite out of the woods yet, Tony, but we're working on it. Do we know where, which door he's closest to? Harrisonburg, uh, Tony, so your quickest drive from Pikesville, Maryland would be to our Harrisonburg retail store. Uh, less than three hours, uh, probably right down 81, I would imagine, right? Uh, and it's a great store. I've been over there. We filmed a commercial there, so it's, uh, it's a cool store and a lot of great stuff there. Um, but uh, so, yeah. All right. Back to, oh, wait, hold on. We got some stuff coming in on YouTube. Uh, too old now to install, but done before. I feel you there. Uh, this is from Anthony Mercer. Uh, as I get older and larger, it's hard to get into, you know, upside down in your trunk or in your in your front seats uh, trying to install stuff. Uh, not as easy as it used to be, for sure. Uh, I wish they would use uh, pop-off speaker covers instead of taking everything apart just to get to the speaker. That's a comment we can talk about. That's where we're mm -hmm. heading next. Uh, talk about. Uh, what it was like to install those kicker speakers. So because they were components, it, it was quite the job. It was a very fun job. Um, I had all the, all the tools, the accessories and knowledge um, to definitely tackle it um, with what we had there. So, but taking everything apart, um, it was a lot of fun. So what's on the screen right now, you just may have seen uh, a set of installation instructions was sitting on that table. We call them master sheets. Mm -hmm. They are illustrated instructions that show you how to take your doors apart to get your factory speakers out, how to get your radio out of your dash. Uh, and as your trainer, uh, my job, one of my jobs was to print up a set of master sheets and hand them to you so that when you open the doors of your Corolla, you could know exactly how to take those doors apart to get mm -hmm. to those speakers. How did that work out for you? 
Um, they never got to me. What? And then when they did get to me, I already had the door apart. So, so they would be very helpful, but I didn't use them that time. <laughs> yeah, we did not get you the master sheets in time, but uh, you and uh, you, you had help working in the car. You had Sage, another yes. one of our trainees. You both were basically, you were on the driver's side. She was on the passenger yes. side. Uh, did you have any issues taking the doors apart? Not, not really. Um, I mean, there was a few things we had to have some help with drilling out rivets, um, finding the appropriate, uh, you know, size socket for some stuff. But um, I mean, we just did it, and I was thankful to have her help for sure. We got it done. And a lot of taking a door apart can be one of the scariest things in car stereo, especially if it's the first time that door has been taken apart. Yep. Clips might break. It feels like you're gonna break something when you're pulling things. Did you did you break anything? There was one clip. Um, that was already broken, so it was easy to get off. Kind of felt like we were breaking it, but it was already broken. And then uh, we did break, I broke one clip on, on my side. Did that make it hard to put the door back together or did it go back in okay? No, it went back in fine. There was plenty of other clips, so I didn't even notice it to put yeah. it back. Good, that's been my experience too. <laughs> yeah, I just it's loved it. <laughs> it's rare that you'd get through one where nothing breaks. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so you mentioned the, these were component speakers you guys were installing. Uh, how is that? How is components harder than just like installing a two-way coax speaker? So we had to hook up uh, the tweeter with the woofer, um, and it was an external crossover, so we had to hook that up. Um, there was some trouble with kind of rerouting the signal in there as far as where it came in through the tweeter. So just figuring out where everything went in, hooked up to each other, and then where to mount the crossover. It was a little bit more than just taking the old one out and putting a new one in. Yeah. Uh, I see Anthony's uh, still asking. I'm not sure I fully answered Anthony's actual Anthony's actual question, which was uh, he wished the speaker grills would just pop off. Yours, that was not the case, right? No. Your grills, you had to take the whole door panel off. Yes. It's actually pretty rare that you can just pop off a speaker grill in a car. I've seen it in some cars, uh, Honda Civics, uh, yeah, older my, my ones. Yeah, Honda Civics like that. There you go. You, you can actually just pop the grill off, three screws, factory speaker comes out. It's a thing of beauty when that happens because that is by far easier. Um, but yeah, it's just not the case in most cars. Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, Colton says, over the past month I studied all of your videos. Uh-oh. Is this going to be good? Sounds like us. Uh, yeah. I studied all of your videos and was able to install new head unit speakers and subwoofers. Really appreciated. LOL. Heck, let, let's give that That's guy awesome. a clap. That is awesome. That's really cool. That's the entire video team and then some, uh, you know, you basically are affirming what we do every day. Uh, this is what we want to be the case, to help you feel comfortable installing stuff, even if you've never done it before. Uh, let's see, Colton also said, your explanations are very well put together and easy to follow. Top tier professionalism, heck yeah. Madwood Barbecue. That's probably a free plug for Madwood Barbecue. Hello, hello from Iowa. Right on. That's uh, my dad is uh, my home. My dad's home state is Iowa. Been there many times. Uh, let's see on Facebook. Uh, let's see. Dave says need help, and then there's a sad face. Uh, looking to add powered speakers, Bluetooth to my TV, and pretty much all listen to music. I'm having a hard time. Uh, is uh, so. We've got, uh, so obviously that's, that's not what we're talking about at the moment in here. Uh, we haven't even trained River on home products yet, but we can certainly help with that. Uh, you wanted to add powered speakers, Bluetooth to your TV. Uh, it sounds to me like you want a sound bar, uh, Dave, because a sound bar uh, usually is a Bluetooth speaker that you can stream music to it from your phone. Uh, it definitely connects to your TV and makes your TV sound better. Uh, and some of our, in fact, a lot of our sound bars now are fantastic at simply playing music. So even if your TV's off, you can still play music to your sound bar. But a good sound bar that is powered uh, with it, like a, usually with a subwoofer to go with it, will sound full and rich for your music. And then when you turn your TV on, no matter what you're watching on TV, it can be the audio solution for that as well. Uh, so I would say start looking at powered sound bars. Uh, and as always at Crutchfield, uh, if you need an answer now, uh, if you need to solve a problem, uh, if you can't wait for a live to do it in a situation like this, call us. Uh, go to contact us right up at the top of the page there on crutchfield.com. You can reach out live to our advisors either on the phone or you can chat with them online. Starting next week, River will be one of those advisors. So uh, Dan says, repping Seaville. Right on, Dan. Thank you for watching. Uh, hello form from Mauritius MU. Where is the MU? Is that somewhere in the Pacific? That sounds like a Pacific Island. 
Mauritania? I don't know. If I'm, am I making up things right now? That could be. Mauritius? See, that's the, that's the comment from YouTube from ESRM Chris Boo. Uh, wherever you are, hello, Chris. Thank you for watching. Um, did we already talk about why you picked out the Kicker KS component speakers? We did not, but I'd be happy to. Well, yeah, and I've got them uh, on my computer here if you want to throw those up on the screen. These are the speakers that River and Sage installed in your Corolla. How did you decide on these speakers? Well, I knew that I wanted kickers. I've heard lots about kickers before I knew anything about car audio. Uh, so that was my first thing. I went to the kickers. Um, and there was Had you heard about kicker even before coming to Crutchfield? Yes. So this was a brand of car audio you'd heard of, even though you haven't been in the world of car audio much. Yes. That speaks a lot for their name recognition. Oh, yeah. And I'm not surprised. I mean, we sell a lot of kicker speakers. <laughs> They're great. Yeah, so I went through. I knew there was a couple different uh, models of the kickers. And I compared um, things like the frequency response, the power handling, sensitivity, uh, based on what I was using them in, and then use speaker compare to kind of compare and listen to different songs through there. And the Kicker KS really caught my ear. Nice. So speaker compare, if, I rem if memory serves, we talked about speaker compare a lot on our last Crutchfield Live. We even spoke uh, with, uh, is it uh, Rick Wright, who is uh, responsible for making speaker compare happen. And, uh, and so if you watch that one, you'll know all about this. If you didn't, here's the short version. It is a way where you can go to crutchfield.com with a set of headphones uh, from your computer, your phone, or your tablet, and you can, uh, using Speaker Compare, have the website emulate the sound of different speakers so that you can get, the, get an idea of what a kicker sounds like next to a Polk, next to a JL Audio, next to a Focal, et cetera, and get an idea for which tonal characteristics you like better, which ones sound brighter and stronger, which ones sound warmer and smoother, which one is more pleasing to your ears. And, uh, and it, it's not exactly like telling you how they will sound exactly in your car, but it does give you an idea of like speaker A versus speaker B. And we actually give our training class time to use that tool in training. And, uh, and so that was helpful for you in picking out Kicker? Yeah, I think that's when we did that in training is when I uh, went through and compared them all and decided. What, uh, what, what kind of music were you playing in speaker compare? And maybe even just in general, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Oh, I, in speaker compare, I compared more of the music I listen to in my car, um, which is more like hip hop or rock music. Um, outside of my car, I enjoy a lot of you know blues music, uh, a lot of bluegrass, like folky music. Um, but specifically in my car, of course, wanted something that I'd be listening to in my car. Yeah, so, yeah. so I listen to mostly like hip hop and uh, like hard rock music. Okay. Yeah. And what stood out about the kickers in speaker compare? Do you do you remember? It's been a few weeks at least. Yeah. So I mean, they're the lows of this kicker KS uh, were just really I don't know, crisp is the right word, but they they just they hit really good um, compared to some of the other ones I listened to. And then the silk dome tweeter, I could hear all the little bits of different instruments that in songs that I some of the instruments I didn't feel like I never heard before mm -hmm. in those songs. So that's really nice to listen to all my favorite songs and kind of get to experience them in a way I just haven't before. And what about the actual listening to them for the first time in the car for real? Did they uh, support your decision? Uh, like, did they make you feel like you had chosen the right speakers? How did they sound? 100%. It, it only took the first song, and, I, and it was a song that I listened to a lot to compare things like that. Um, so I'd heard it multiple times and listening to it for the first time, you could really hear the difference in the instruments and the vocals and all the low frequency, it was, it was really amazing. There's, look, there's you installing a speaker, bra speaker into a speaker bracket. That is. Talk to us about like that whole part of it, like actually physically putting the speaker into the bracket, into the door. Was that easier, harder than expected? What was that like? It seemed harder at first because I wasn't sure where to put it, just all the different spots you could put it. Um, but after just kind of getting hands on and trying it out, um, trying different screws, had to find the right screws for it. Um, they came with the speakers, so that was really easy. Um, once I found the right screws and kind of played around with it, then it just went all together. And how about the tweeter? Tweeter installation for a component system is the wild card, right? Yes. <laughs> we generally refer to it as a custom installation 100% of the time because it's not like the six and a half part, mm -hmm. right? That part is fairly standardized. In yeah. a lot of cars, they've got the right size hole with the bolt pattern. It's in the exact same place. It's sometimes it doesn't even need a bracket. Yeah. Um, tweeters just aren't like that. Um, they're becoming a little bit more cars have tweeter locations, mm -hmm. but not all of our tweeters will fit in those locations. 
And it's a tough thing to measure and get exactly right to know what's going to fit. And if I remember correctly, when we were looking at yours, our system said that these Kicker KS tweeters might not fit. Yeah. Where do the tweeters actually go in your car? Uh, they were in the sail panel. <coughs> The sail panel is right up there inside, like the side mirrors on your yep, car. Yep. Uh, and uh, so, like when you pulled off the sail panel to reveal the tweeter, how was the factory tweeter actually mounted there? So it was on a bracket, um, which was mounted behind the sail panel. Um, and so we took all that apart. Uh, we thought we were going to have to do some some Dremel tools, do some shaving, uh, maybe use some kind of back strap to change around the bracket. Mm -hmm. um, so we, our minds were racing. We had a lot of people's input helping us trying to figure it out. Um, but then we just kind of messed around with it and put it up there and it went all right back together. So how did you mount the tweeter? With the factory bracket and factory sail panel. So the factory tweeter was mounted to a little metal bracket mm -hmm. attached to the metal of the car, yep. which was revealed when you pulled off the cover of the sail panel. Mm -hmm. And it's just held there by like one screw in the back of the yep, tweeter. Yeah, in the back of the tweeter, there's just a little screw hole and we just use the factory one, factory screw and put it right back on. So unscrewed the factory tweeter and then the new new one just basically bolted yeah. right back into place. It's easy as that. Almost as if like it was just made to go there. Yeah. <laughs> It is not always that easy. Let me be very clear here. Tweeter installation is still something we consider a custom deal. There is often hot glue and uh, making a bracket involved. There is often uh, dremeling or trimming of your car's plastic trim panels and things. That's normal when it comes to installing a tweeters. You had a much easier than average tweeter installation for sure. Thankfully. What about these component crossovers? Uh, they've got to be put somewhere. Where did you decide to put them and why? So I put those behind the woofer inside of the door. Uh, we used some zip ties to mount them to like a, it was a thick wire and harness that was behind there. Why did you put them in the door? I remember we were, there was a lot of discussion about where to put them in the kick panel, in the door, up high in the door, down low in the yeah. door. Why did you put them where you put them? So we stayed away from putting them inside the car because uh, we would have had to route the wires in um, to the door, which is, would have been a little too much for what we had there. Yeah. Um, so then there was also the thought of weather, uh, weather getting to the crossover, uh, maybe you know wrapping it in some weatherproofing, something like that. Uh, but we didn't have any of that, so it was kind of the best place to put them. Um, so we put them kind of towards the front of the door and up off the very bottom. So if no weather could get to them, they were secure back there. And then we secured them really tight so there was no rattling. Nice. So zip ties held them in tight yep. uh, and they're not sitting in the bottom of the door. So even if water did collect down there, it wouldn't get into the component yep. crossover. Nice. Uh, we've got some uh, extra comments. For, for one, our research department found out that Mauritius is the African island nation, uh, an African island nation in the Indian Ocean. So uh, we are really, truly worldwide here, uh, multiple continents involved. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for watching from Mauritius. And Kelly says uh, on Facebook, looking forward to referring people to River and Crutchfield. This live video has been very helpful. Thank you. You're already helping customers, <laughs> uh, giving people confidence to try an installation for themselves. Uh, and so this is already going uh, just like we'd hoped. So. What's next for your car stereo? Now that you've gotten your feet wet with some installations, uh, what, are you, what are your plans? Next is deciding what I'm doing with the sub and amp that I bought to put in my Corolla. Yeah, if we had had time on Friday, we would have taken out that monstrous sub in your trunk now yeah. and replaced it with one that is still going to give you a ton of bass, oh, yeah. but won't be quite as humongous. Uh, but yeah, so now I still have that. We didn't have time to do that Friday. So what are you, yeah, you going to do with it? Yeah, it's not in my Corolla. It's sitting in my room. Um, so I'm actually planning on buying a Jeep this weekend. Nice. So I'm, my, you know, mine was racing. And maybe just put that in the Jeep. Sweet. Uh, will it fit in like, I'm, I'm trying to picture where a big sub like that would go in a Jeep. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it'll, it'll go in the trunk area. So it's sure. not a Jeep Wrangler. What kind of Jeep is it? It's a Jeep Cherokee. Got it. Yeah. Uh, which kind? The, the it's a 98 XJ. XJ, so the square kind, the yes. cool the yeah, kind the of cool kind, Cherokee. For sure. uh, not, not your grandma's Jeep, no. Grand Cherokee. <laughs> no. Good. Uh, so yeah, plenty of room in the back of that for that kind of a sub. Uh, and you've got the amp and the amp wiring yeah. kit, so that'll be like the next thing you're going to install when you get the, like you're buying the Jeep. It's yeah. a kind yeah. of a done deal. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. Leave that other sub in the Corolla that you're going to, you know, you don't need that to carry stuff around. You can just use the Jeep for that. Yep, that's the plan. I love it. Um, 
Do we want to look at our poll results? Do we want to close this poll? Because I think we are about done talking about car stuff. Uh, hopefully Jeffrey from Facebook isn't too annoyed that we had to start with car. We're going to get to some home stuff here in a minute. Um, but uh, should we close this poll out? Do I need to do that? Let's see what happens if I hit close poll. Some... All right, cool. Uh, oh, look. Closing the poll revealed some more questions. Uh, let's see. The Nolan 17 said, installing speakers into your own car feels like therapy. Huh. Is that a good thing? I think so. You interpret that as good? Yeah. Like, like that's therapeutic? Yeah. That makes you feel good. better? Maybe a little cathartic? Yeah. I like that. I'm, a, I'm in agreement with that. Uh, Robert LaFollette says, I have a JL4004 DXD. That's an, uh, I think that's a four channel, 100 watt by four amplifier, if I'm reading model numbers right. An Alpine 500 slash one. What kind of amp is that? That is. I'm putting you on the spot that, and I know. That's a mono it. amp. That's a mono amp, yeah. exactly. Probably about 500 watts yeah. by two ohms <laughs> uh, for bass. Alpine 6 by 9 is up front in an Avalon XSPE. Um, maybe that is like a special edition uh, Toyota Avalon. I am looking into a set of Infinity 931X, maybe a 693M. So that's reference series and Kappa series, I think. Uh, 185 versus 123 for the 93iX. C3 in my deck. Any uh, in deck, any ideas? Uh, well, you can't go wrong with Infinity. You've got great power. Uh, you've got a, a great sub amp. Um, uh, I mean, I think you're on the right track there, Robert. Uh, I don't know that I could uh, suggest anything that you uh, that would be better than what you've got planned. Uh, we would obviously, if you were on the phones with one of our advisors, they would be asking you questions like, what kind of music do you listen to? How loud do you like it? Uh, who drives the car? Who plays the music? All of that kind of stuff, right? Yep. That's the plan next week is to ask those questions when people call. Uh, and then they can make a really very personalized recommendation based on exactly what you're doing. But what you've laid out here, uh, based on my experience, looks like a solid deal. All right, here's the answers to the, uh, the poll questions. Uh, overwhelming, 63% of people responding to this poll on YouTube said, no problem, I've done it before. 21% never done it, but willing to try. Good for you. 15% uh, Ned said, uh, need a friend to help, but yes. And uh, last but not least, nobody said, no way, take it to a pro. So everybody's willing, willing to at least give it a try. Uh, let's see what happened on Facebook. Never done it before, but willing to try 10%. No way, not for me, I'll take it to a professional, 10%. I've got a buddy to help me, so we should be fine, 30%. But the winner is, no problem, I've installed stuff before. So we're talking to people that have been getting their hands dirty in their cars for a while and are not afraid to do it again. So awesome, kudos to you guys. River, thank you so much for uh, coming in and joining us on this crazy idea of putting <laughs> a eight-week employee right here on live. But uh, you, your uh, go get them attitude, willingness to get in there and do that stuff in your car, and willingness to talk to me about it is just fantastic. We couldn't pass up the opportunity to have you on live. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. Glad R to be here. River will indeed be on the phones next week, taking her first calls ever. So if there's a, if you want to, you might be able to get in touch with River next week. Uh, we're going to transition totally now in a couple ways. We're going to transition into not talking car audio. We're going to talk about cameras now. And we've got two camera experts sitting in the studio next to where I'm sitting in our home studio. We've got Ned and Zach. Ned and Zach have recently had a chance to uh, get some their hands on some Leica cameras, uh, which are some of our nicest and most expensive cameras. Uh, and they want to talk about them. They've got stuff to say. So I'm going to just sort of shut up and sit over here on the home set on the car set. I'll be watching your comments though on YouTube and Facebook. So please keep them coming in. I'll feed Ned and Zach as they start to talk about their experience with some Leica cameras. You guys ready over there? All right. I guess we're, we're on. We're talking. I'm Zach with the video team. I'm Ned. I'm a home audio writer. I write about a lot of other stuff too, including Leica cameras. Yeah, we were uh, super lucky. Leica sent us some really nice cameras to play with. And uh, it's been a while since I got my hands on a Leica, so I, I had a great time with the one I had. Yeah, I, I uh, learned how to take pictures on a Leica back in the late 70s, early 80s. My dad had an old rangefinder and uh, maybe an M3, I think. And so I was excited to look at these cameras on paper because they behave a lot the same way as the old ones do. And 
That's the only way I know how to take pictures. I had the uh, Q2 Monochrome, which is a very unique camera. It's a full frame sensor. It's a fixed lens camera, so it's really a point and shoot camera, but not like you know you might think of a point and shoot. No. Um, but full frame, black and white only sensor. So yeah, a, a giant sensor that doesn't have the color layers. So you know, immediately the question is, why does someone want to spend this kind of money on a camera that's only black and white? And the answer is. Well, that's, that's a great question. I think uh, someone who's uh, looking, there's a lot of black and white fine art photographers out there, yep. and they haven't really had many digital options. Uh, of course, Leica makes an M10 monochrome. Uh, they may have made a monochrome before that too, but it's based on the yep. rangefinder body. This one's a little, uh, it's, got, it's got the nice manual controls you expect from Leica, but it's also got the modern digital features you might want, like uh, nice fast autofocus, um, some kind of combination of the, uh, the, the two, a screen you can use for focusing if you want. Yeah, you can use a live view screen. I mean, I found myself using the live view occasionally, but most of the time I like really that I could go back to uh, the using the f-stop, the aperture control, uh, the, the shutter speed, and you do need to go into a menu to set the ISO on there. I don't, I don't remember, did it have an ISO, manual adjust ISO? The, the M, M10 that we also had did have a manual adjust uh, ISO on, on the body. But what I really liked about it was, you know, when I didn't really keep up with digital cameras uh, after spending a lot of time in dark rooms as a kid and as a teenager and as a 20 something. Um, and so, one of the things that always turned me off was having to go into menus to do the things that I was familiar with doing, with changing aperture and um, just just being able to, actually even manual focus. I mean, autofocus, uh, it's funny when we talked about our different experiences using this camera, you used autofocus almost exclusively, even though I know you've got a lot of experience with the old film style cameras. I just couldn't let that happen. I, I, could, I could only shoot when I was uh, using the manual controls, only get kind of what I wanted when I was using the manual controls. Well, that's what Leica does so well, though. They have, everything is right, you're right on. It's, just, it's physical, tactile controls over everything that's yeah. important. You can get into the menu and, and um, set some parameters. Uh, for instance, auto ISO, you can tell that how to behave, how yeah. high to go, what your shutter speed, your minimum shutter speed should be. And, and meanwhile, the, the Let's backpedal a little bit and just talk about, again, why black and white. Yeah. Well, one of the things is um, this is a mirrorless camera. It's a full-frame sensor, and it's just the, the amount of detail that you can pick up with it is amazing. And the ISO maximum is 100,000, which is pretty mind-boggling for someone coming from thinking about it in terms of the way film might cap out at what, 3200 did we say? 3200 is what I always remember. And yeah. you could always kind of trick it to maybe, you know, underexpose and overdevelop a little bit to get those higher ISOs. But ISO is a legacy film term that we, you, know, right. you also hear it as ASA or something, but it's, yeah. it's the speed of your film and it's, it translates over to these sensors. And the, uh, that black and white sensor has no red, green, blue layer in front of it, you know, very slightly blocking any of the light that gets to it. It just gets straight to those black and white pixels. Yeah, and, and so... it's because of that, you have amazing, incredible shadow detail. You have uh, just incredible sharpness and detail and a lot of pixels, too. A lot of pixels. Day. What I really love about it is when you take an image and you get it in, in, a, in, in great focus um, and then you're looking at it, reviewing it later, uh, and you want to zoom in, the level of detail that is just in a you know in a, in a small crop of your your image, you still get incredible detail. So you could really uh, you can just really capture a lot of detail. And that uh, ISO uh, on that Q2 monochrome that goes that high is no gimmick. I mean, sometimes you'll see that high number is kind of a you know a marketing bullet point kind of right. thing. It, it'll, it'll do it, but you would never want to. But man, with that Q2, you could really, really push it up there. And once I realized that, I, you know, you can do things in very dim light that you wouldn't think of doing otherwise, like stopping down the aperture a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because you've got all that headroom to work with. And uh, 
I just, I, it was just uh, incredible. It, it was, um, you get a black and white view through the viewfinder, so you're looking at a black and white world while you're trying to take a black and white picture, which was a novelty to me. Yeah, yeah, yep. you know? that's something that you could never do on a film camera because you're always looking through the viewfinder and you're just seeing right through the camera. And, and um, So maybe one of the interesting things that I found when I was roaming around taking pictures with the thing was with the Q2 monochrome, that is, um, was it just reminded me of how differently I look at subjects when I'm not shooting in color. Yeah, my brain turns everything into angles and shapes and shadows and more so than it does with looking for pops of color, maybe if I'm shooting with a different camera. Yeah, or you're not distracted yeah. by the color with the image. You, you, you kind of get down to the heart of it. If, you know, if you've got a portrait where the of a person and, and they're rather somewhat small inside the frame um, in a color image sometimes you might not even your eyes don't necessarily get drawn to them and I was looking at an old picture of my brother in black and white when he was a kid and he's kind of surrounded by space and he's in the middle but he's wearing a bald wig and a black mustache and uh, beard so he's it's he de your eye is definitely drawn to him but I don't think it would be so much if you were doing it with a a, a color version of the same image so it's just it really makes a fundamental change on the way I look at what I'm taking pictures of. So, you know, moving on to your camera that you use, the M10. Um, yeah. Of course, you were just t you were talking before about the M3 and learning on that. And these cameras go way back uh, in time. Um, they uh, invented 35 millimeter film. Yeah, we we haven't really even talked about Leica as a brand. Yeah. They, started in 1869 in Germany. Wow. Um, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, it's a very old company. And so many of the classic images that you see of history of the early part of the 20th century was taken on, were taken on Leica cameras. Um, I'm really, it's, it's been fun for me as, the, as we bring more of their products in. We've got a, a bunch of these cameras and lenses. We've got uh, binoculars and you know, their optics are just really beautiful and clear. The, the, the look of the images that you capture with them have a certain flavor that is kind of unmistakably Leica, which you kind of, I guess you got to get your, your hands dirty with, with Leica for a little while to sort of understand that and, and, and see how it feels. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. That's a picture of the, uh, what's that building called again? Uh, that's the code building there. The new the... code building. Yeah, yeah. Now we're looking at a, an art park. Oh, that's a, an M10 image of uh, oh, yeah, my that. dog. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Look at the detail. Oh, my '65 Mustang. Nice again uh, with the M10. And I wish we could actually. There's my old J45, my 42 J45. I wish we could zoom in on these. Um, Josh took. Oh, that's it. But the SL2. Um, yeah, we should mention that third camera that we were allowed to borrow. We had a, a third uh, person, uh, one of our writers. <laughs> um, who was using the SL2, which is kind of their mirrorless um, kind of, uh, it's an interchangeable lens. Yeah. It, shoot, it feels like, uh, you know, an, an, um, an SLR camera. It's got a grip. And right. It's big and ready to rumble in pretty much every uh, situation. But you can see what Josh was able to do with it. And there's, and there's your picture of your dog looking Yeah, and she's a black dog, and, you know, and there's a lot of just stuff coming in, detail coming out of the shadows that I was not used to uh, shooting my normal but here, you know, th that's one. I'm shooting a 28 millimeter wide lens, and you're able to punch into the middle and still get a decent sized image because yep. you have all that. That's Bill Crutchfield's old house. Yeah. Yeah, it was so much fun uh, taking all these pictures. Uh, just different, uh, it, different stuff you can do with them, and it's uh, you know to come back no to that camera. question of like, you know, what's the appeal? I, I know josh was i was talking with josh the other day and he was saying well the best camera is the the camera you have with you at the right time right this is usually my phone usually you know? your phone of course and and i i'm i'm that kind of person these days i really do probably take 90 percent of my photos on a phone i'm not so you yeah. know I'm, but um when i got this in my hands and and got to keep it for a couple of weeks i took it out to um chincoteague and assateague island um out on the eastern shore of virginia and just had a really fun time um, taking images on the beach, taking images um, wherever you see patterns, wherever you see shadows yeah. that are that are of, of of symmetry that just 
it, it kind of makes you want to take pictures. And I, I really like not, even though there are some, tons of menu options that you can do. I really like all the manual control, of course. I love not having to change a lens. You know, the, mm. the 28 millimeter lens is a pretty good angle that you can do a lot it's with it. It's about what your iPhone field of view yeah. is. It's roughly, it's close to 28, it might be 30 or something. Yeah, and it's it a relatively, looks like that. it's a relatively lightweight camera too, uh, but at the same time, one of the cool things about Leica is just the precision machining of all the parts. I mean, when you turn the focus ring, when you turn the, f-stop ring when you when you use the buttons on the camera you're like this thing is solid and this just they last a long time right yeah the the mechanics and the machining of those things is just incredible i mean even even that screw on hood uh for the q2 i noticed it screws on smooth just enough to be perfectly lined up straight I've yeah had a, i've had yeah. some in the past where they're a little cockeyed sometimes. right uh but they you know that's that's part of their legacy their history just making outstanding the kind of the kind of camera you would buy and, and that would be the last camera you'd ever have to buy again yeah it's you know? funny when they, when Leica shipped them to us uh, Josh got the box I think he opened it up and there were not cases not uh, not a lot of protection they, they weren't come they didn't come in boxes these cameras had obviously been used but they were in great shape and I, I took mine over my shoulder to the beach I took oh, yeah. it in the woods with me and I didn't ever worry like oh I'm I gotta be careful with this thing. I mean, you want to be careful to, to a certain extent, but just real durable feeling. And yeah, they're they're built they're built for life kind of thing uh, is is how they are. I mean, you're talking about that M3 that you learned how to take pictures on back yeah. in the day is probably still in service. I wish somewhere. I still had it. What did my dad do with it? I don't and even know. So going from the M3, which is an old camera, yeah, that goes back. I don't know, fifties could probably? be the fifties. Mm -hmm. I'm I'll probably wrong, but a long time. Yeah. So when you pick up the M10, a very modern camera, yeah, uh, how long does it take you to get acquainted? Well, I did have f some fun. I really liked the Leica uh, menus. I found that compared to some other old point-and-shoot digitals that I used back in the dawn of digital um, and sort of what turned me off of digital in the first place was just getting lost in those menus. I found that they were pretty easy to navigate, but what I really liked was no matter what you set it for, as soon as you grab one of the manual controls on the body of the camera, that overrides it, and you're, yeah. you're back in control, which is, you know, I, I'm used to moving the shutter speed with my thumb on the fly and moving the f-stop on the fly mm -hmm. and focusing on the fly. The M10, actually, and the M11, which is the new model. We, the M10, we don't carry. We do carry the M10 monochrome, but the M11, we carry the color version as well, and it um, it allows you to, um, oh, what am I thinking of here? Uh, you you can take control of what you need to when you want to, you don't. Yes, not, yes, yes, yes. Um, we were talking, uh, talking about the menus. Uh, one thing I would, I mean, maybe you're getting at something you can, like this. Uh, yeah. What I notice is that Leica clearly has photographers as part of their, and I'm guessing here, design uh, team. But I think they're part of the design team that handles the cameras because you don't you you get things that are it makes just everything easy to shoot. There's there's no there's no uh, um, engineers are super important to the process too. But there's kind of an ergonomic component to it that I've had cameras in the past where they made something hard to do that I wanted to do all the time. Right, right. And uh, right. Leica does none of that. And even that menu system you were talking about, really nice thing. One tap of the menu. First of all, in the back of the camera, there's four buttons, three yeah. buttons maybe. Yeah. And you hit that menu button, up comes your kind of quick menu of stuff you might want to mess with a little bit on the fly. If you need to get into the deep into it, you press it again, and then you're in there. And then a half press of the shutter overrides it all on your back to it. So they stay out of your way. Yeah. And I think they know, uh, they, they must get some input along the way of, of people that handle cameras on a daily basis. Oh, I'm sure. I and, mean, you know, if you're, out, if you're out in a war zone with your uh, Leica camera, which many of them have been there, um, you don't have time to mess with stuff. You just, I mean, like you said, you've got to be able to grab uh adjust those three factors of the uh, exposure trend. Yeah, I was just run. just working today on a, an incoming Leica that is the the reporter, the Q2 monochrome reporter, which is very much, you know, 
Yeah. Same guts as what we were using, but a, with a Kevlar armor on it. And I think it's no, tough enough yeah, anyway. Yeah, you know? tough enough. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So it's bulletproof? I suppose so. I'd wear it right here, I think, if I was I had that one. Yeah. But I'm but impressive, you know. They're they're just they make timeless uh, machines that just keep keep on cranking the workout, you know. Absolutely. Um, I've got this in my pocket. This here little piece of Leica technology that I got it for my wife for Valentine's Day. Um, it's the Monovid. And it's a little six times uh, magnifier that I mentioned we'd like to go out to Chicoteague and Assateague Islands on the Eastern Shore. So you're looking and at birds and distance. We bike like all the time because that's the best way to get to where we're going and, and avoid people. And so there are a lot of birds out there, a lot of good stuff to look at. And this thing, you don't need the case. The case is cool, but you can just pop it in your pocket. And yeah, that's nice and compact. You can still ride while you're doing it. And... And it looks fantastic. It really looks fantastic. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, that's and that's. Um, you you may have mentioned it once before, but worth mentioning again that Leica makes other stuff, binoculars, monoculars. Yeah, but what the, what what kind of unifies all the stuff is the glass and the optics is yeah. is something that they just. It's it's high on their agenda, and it's and it's great stuff. Yeah, it's funny that M10 that they sent us. I got the feeling that the lens that they had sent with it, because uh, that's the rangefinder interchangeable lens, and we had I think a 35 millimeter lens. On yeah, it was a 35 millimeter. And lens. it felt like uh, maybe an older lens, you know. It, yeah. Um, it just had that. Um, those. Uh, it just felt like it had been used for a while. Well, if you have an old M Leica, uh, you know, from the 50s beyond, and 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 all all throughout the time they've been making them. Any of those lenses will go on the new M M10 and M11 cameras as well. So it's yeah, and that's a great thing because those lenses last forever, and there's so many of them floating around still that were made 50, 60, 70 years ago at this yeah. point. Yeah, uh, but you know, more. one thing uh, you talked about uh, wishing that that screen would flip out to the side or flip up so that you could get some angle shots. That, that, was, my, that was my only regret, you know, it's like a, a, a tiny scratch on the underside of your bumper of a new car kind of, kind of thing. Well, but since I've been, you know, I've been. The way I like to shoot, yeah, I like, I like shooting from waist level. I've oh, got, there's lots of times you might want yeah. to do that. That's a, that's a great thing that we've got this like the Visoflex 2 that, that can mount on the hot shoe of that camera. Perfect. And, you know, allows you to get that angle and also Actually, does, it might not mount on the Q2. It might be for the M11 only. And w what it also does is, since it reads directly to the sensor, we didn't really talk about range finders and the different technology that those, not, I'm not talking about range finders, the, the, the distance finding stuff, but the range finder style camera that uses a parallax view to focus uh, when you're looking through the viewfinder, the yeah. So why don't you why don't you um, just uh, explain shooting with a rangefinder camera real quick? Because yeah, it's, it's a manual. It's how I learned, camera. and so it's very familiar to me. But it's, I know it seems odd to people who are come, coming coming so to you, it. Without how do you doing... get stuff in focus? Because you're not seeing so, like an SLR. You're actually seeing what's through the lens. But right. Here you're not. You're looking. Yeah. When you're window. looking through a rangefinder camera, the viewfinder, not the live view on the back, that gives you straight to the sensor view. But um, when you're looking through that, you you've actually if you look at the M10 and M11 cameras, there's two little windows on the front of the camera. And when you look through the optical viewfinder, you are getting a kind of a collation of those two views. It's, and you, you've got a little yeah. square in the middle of your frame. And when you look at it, uh, you'll, see, you'll see two of these. One is sort of, a, you know, one is they're sort of holographic looking, right? And as you focus, they fuse together. And when you get them fused together, you're in perfect focus. Or what I, I, you know, I had to, I probably w used the, the live view more often and the focus peaking uh, that we, we both, I think, were yeah. really impressed with the, the, the Leica focus peaking feature. I, I certainly was. I, I use that when I'm on a tripod sometimes or if I'm shooting a macro shot where I've got very little uh, depth of field to work with. That focus peaking helps, and um, so it's, when, when you it know, first came how it out, works. It, it yeah. would it would kind of just find edges of things, and it'll light up in a different color, so you know what's sharp and what isn't. But what I liked about the the Leica was it's like a blanket. Yeah, it kind of gives you degrees of so like a blanket, and it's it knows that it knows that uh, band of 
in focus that you're going to get at that particular aperture, and it, and it will, and it's just so easy to visualize when you're using that that focus beacon. And it was real impressed. Yeah, it's cool for me because I love the concept of of, of depth of field, and I I felt like as a kid I really learned that if I could was on a out on a bright day I could close my aperture all down all the way that it would go and and then every pretty much everything would be in focus not everything but you have a really deep depth of field or if you've got lower light and you're on a pretty wide open aperture which Leica says there's some conventional wisdom says that the best to get the best view out of a Leica lens open it up all the way and let the glass really take over but I like I like shooting with it open and and and, and close down as well but the, the, the focus peaking really, it is like a glittering blanket of, of what's in focus that sort of, as you move, change the focal length, yeah, um, it moves, it, it moves across and... what's in focus and it just lets you see, you know, when you notice that it's on the eyes of your subject and, and you know, other facial features of your subject, you're in business. Um, but there are other times where I, I love just going back in time and, and looking through the range finder and you know you can even see the side of the lens when you look through the the optical viewfinder at that time, yeah. and you and you're focusing, your your frame is kind of a, a holographic looking frame. Yeah, um, it's superimposed on there, and it gives you it gives you borders, but it's not 100 percent precise. Yeah, it's, kinda, it's, it's, you kind of give yourself a little room, but it's just a different way to shoot. And uh, got it. Yeah, a great way to do it. Oh. Right. Yeah, we've spent some time the other day chatting with Kramer about these cameras and you should definitely check out that video, right? Yeah, we've got, uh, it's kind of more of this, but just kind of talking about how, what we liked about it and, um, and just a little, bit, a little bit of a longer form. We get another perspective in, uh, in Josh. Yeah, know. and he spent so much time with the SL2 and he talks a little more extensively about that. And that's gonna be, you know, that's sort of the professional's camera. I think of the Q2 monochrome as just kind of a perfect fine art photographer or just on the fly. And it's like we said, it's not a point and shoot, but it's, it gives you that quickness and, and, and immediacy. Yeah, if you're a black and white fine art type of shooter and like to print big or print really detailed uh, photographs, that hard to beat that. I mean, there's just nothing else like it out there right now. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, Thanks for uh, hanging out with us, uh, talking about cameras. We don't get to talk about cameras enough. Yeah, enough. yeah. I mean, I think you'd have a lot of fun if you got one of these Q2 monochromes. They just, oh I, I could, I was sad to see it go, and I could have spent. I was too. The rest was, of my life using it. it. We became fast friends, and uh, I'm just uh, happy that Leica sent them to us, and and, uh, and hey guys, enjoyed our time. Can you hear me over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, buddy. I can see you on this hand fancy monitor over here. We did have a couple comments come in while you guys were talking. Well, uh, right. Nobody asked any, like, pressing questions. That's why I didn't break in into the middle of your conversation. And it sounds like you guys were on a roll anyway. So uh, I did want to let you know, Living Loud with Andy said he's got a Sony SV-1 as a great entry-level camera. Uh, Anthony Mercer said, coming from film, yes, also a big thumbs up. Robert LaFollette said, thanks, Robert. So it uh, sounds like we did have some people pretty into what you guys were talking about uh, over there. And uh, thank you, guys. This has been great. Thanks, JR. Thank you, JR. And thank every thanks, everybody, who commented during that. Thank you very much. Yeah, look at that. First time using two sets. It worked. <laughs> we figured it out, everybody. Uh, awesome. Uh, back here on the, uh, on the car set, we're not actually going to talk car stuff. I've got Eric Angevine with me uh, because uh, we're going to be talking about Bowers and Wilkins. Right. We've got a couple things we want to tell you about regarding Bowers and Wilkins. One of them is this Zeppelin speaker, uh, which they have a new version of. We've got mm -hmm. it here. We've been listening to it here at Crutchfield. Uh, we've also want to talk about some deals going on mm -hmm. with Bowers and Wilkins. Uh, if you haven't heard of Bowers and Wilkins, I've got some stuff to maybe make sure you should know. Mm -hmm. about Bowers and Wilkins. They've been around quite a long time. Yeah. Uh, designing speakers that uh, often don't look like other speakers. <laughs> right. uh, some very unique yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I've, I've always felt like uh, them being around this long uh, has allowed them to innovate a lot. Uh, it, when you read through uh, a page that we've written about one of these speakers, there's lots of trademarks on there. Yeah. And that's a sure sign that they've been developing a lot of their own technology so they sound like nobody else. 
They sound like nobody else. They often look like nobody else. One of the things they are known for is designing speakers. They, one of their taglines is uh, changing the, well, I wrote it down here earlier, changing the shape of loudspeaker design. And they've been doing that since uh, the, the 50 years ago. Uh, they've been doing that. Uh, more recently, uh, you can find their speakers. They are the exclusive speaker found and headphone found in Abbey Road Studios. That's mm. That's kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I think it's pretty, pretty good music has come out <laughs> yeah. of Abbey Road Studios. And so uh, if you're working or making music or mixing or mastering mm -hmm. in Abbey Road, you're listening to Bowers and Wilkins. There's a reason for that. And it's, it's kind of like sonic purity, really, yeah. is what I would describe here. Yeah, yeah. When I've listened to them, accuracy is always one of the first things that I notice. I'm like, just I'm hearing a lot more than I feel like I can hear with some other uh, speakers. Uh, that maybe haven't put that much sure. time into developing their sound. And you've actually had some Bowers and Wilkins at yeah. your house, so you had not just a couple hours of listening right. in our vendor training room, you you got to really spend some quality time. Which uh, Bowers and Wilkins speakers did you have? Uh, I had the tower speakers, I believe it was one of the 700 series. That would mean the tower speakers with the yeah. tweeter on top. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, I had more time than I probably uh, would have had otherwise because <laughs> it was during the, the initial stages of the lockdown. Oh, and they were like, please um, don't come back <laughs> to the building. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just keep hold on to those speakers. We don't yeah. want you bringing anything into the building right, right now. Got and it. And so this was the first catalog that we did during that period of time. So they sent the speakers directly to my house. And so uh, my son and I put them together and, and set them up in our, in our house and listened to them uh, throughout that entire period. It was uh, maybe a, a silver lining to that cloud. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I mean... That's uh, it's not a bad way to listen to music yeah. at any point, and if you have to be stuck at home, it's nice to have some decent speakers exactly. with which to do that. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to pull up these speakers here, the ones that you mentioned you had at home, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So like the 702 S2, and they do that thing with the tweeter mm -hmm. on top. Well, uh, if you look at that, you see all of that. Like all of that looks different. Each part of that is is something that they've developed over time. Decoupled tweeter. Uh, the material they use for the mid-ranges is called Continuum, trademarked. We don't even know what's really in the secret sauce, but it's amazing. <laughs> and then they uh, use a flow port to, uh, to make the bass sound uh, even better, deeper, and uh, uh, less distortion in the bass. Yeah, the uh, the acoustic decoupling of the yeah. tweeter. Oh, here's your mm -hmm. flow port you That's were just mentioning. Port. That's a, a rear-firing mm -hmm. port. Uh, and that acoustic decoupling. Acoustically decoupled tweeter mm -hmm. uh, doesn't just look cool. I mean, it really does uh, separate out the highs from yep. the mids and the mids mm -hmm. from the lows. Like, it really does a nice job with all of that. Uh, and we've recently did uh, a demo in our, our demo days where we had three sets of speakers right. set up. We had Dave in here talking mm -hmm. about that uh, last time. And people absolutely loved the uh, Bowers & Wilkins yeah. bookshelf speakers. Yeah. Uh, and then most recently, uh, and we have we actually have one here with us uh, is the Bowers and Wilkins yeah. Zeppelin. Uh, I can show you the one right here. This is the speaker we have on the desk with us today. We actually have done a video on it recently. I suggest you check that out. Abby, one of our advisors, was here in the studio uh, talking about this Zeppelin. She took it home for a week. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of hands-on with our oh, products yeah. here lately, guys, uh, and we want to tell you about it so that you know what you're getting into. Um, but this Bowers & Wilkins Zeppelin uh, really impressed us in our demo days. I got a chance to sit down and listen to it. And... Um, uh, and so did you, right? Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Uh, I think it sounds great. I mean, it, it, you see the it's visually appealing from the start, but then you turn it on, you listen to it, and you're kind of blown away. It's like it's not an insubstantial speaker, but it sounds bigger than it looks even. Yeah, and this is not actually a new design. Like no. this <laughs> Zeppelin concept, uh, they've been doing that at Bowers & Wilkins for a while. Uh, if you want to, oh, actually, we're going to show some, there I am, look, I'm on TV, everybody. Uh, there's me uh, listening to this Zeppelin mm -hmm. speaker set, set up in our demo days. Uh, I played a whole bunch of different songs, as you can see there. I was playing some bluegrass stuff, a band from mm -hmm. Canada called the Dead South. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of intricacies on the stringed instruments, a lot of strained vocals, like raspy yeah. voices that really came through nicely. Uh, and then I played some stuff with some heavy bass, mm -hmm. like the way you move, right? Outcast. Right. Really put this thing, mm -hmm. I cranked it up. Uh, probably annoyed some sales advisors outside in the call center. And it didn't bat an eye at anything yeah. I wanted to play. So detailed, full bass. Yeah. Uh, and we were streaming from using our Tidal app on our iPad. So high right. res capable, over Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. took full advantage of all of that. Uh, it's fantastic. 
Yeah, it's just something that's going to look good in whatever room you want to listen to music in as well. If you have kind of that modern design sensibility, I yeah. think people are going to walk into the room and say, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Uh, and like I said, the design is not new. I do kind of want to show yeah. an old product we used to sell, the first mm -hmm. Zeppelin, which these actually, they released these in 2007, the old version of it, which is, uh, as you can see here, was designed to hold your iPod right. on. And uh, they used the most modern <laughs> iPod at the time, which was yeah. an iPod Touch. That was around the time I started here, so I'm sure that we trained on that one. Probably so. Yeah. How about that egg-shaped remote? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, they hadn't really put they were this was not a Wi-Fi mm -hmm. speaker yet. This was right. an iPod dock speaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these days, of course, the Zeppelin, you can just stream it from your phone, from your tablet, uh, over your Wi-Fi. The sound is definitely improved. Uh, you should watch the video with Abby for all the details of how many drivers are in there and how much power and all of that. Um, but yeah, that's the Bowers & Wilkins Zeppelin. Uh, I also want to make mention of something Bowers & Wilkins isn't known for doing, which is um, we have some Bowers & Wilkins that are on sale right now. Yeah. You can actually get a deal on Bowers and Wilkins. So uh, if you want to pull it back up on the uh, computer here, I've got, where is it? There, not there. I've got so many tabs open. <laughs> right here we go. Uh, what we're looking at are the Bowers and Wilkins 600 series yeah. of speakers are on sale right now. The 606 S2, pretty hot deal. That's a thousand dollar pair of speakers right now. Uh, $150 off. This promo started a few days ago and is running through mm -hmm. March 28th. So you have a little bit of time. I wouldn't wait on things. Uh, that's not how you buy things these days. If no. you're waiting, uh, you might miss out. These could be gone. Uh, and then you're waiting for the next shipment to come in. Uh, you've always got 60 days to make sure you're happy with it, which is great. Right on yeah. speakers. You will be. You will be. I mean, you will we be. We have no doubt. <laughs> uh, but uh, in case you're not, we've got your back. But uh, so a bunch of money off of the uh, bookshelves available in several colors. Uh, we've got some floor standing 600 series, $173 off each pair, each yeah. of the 603s. Anytime you see that uh, red uh, lettering with the minus mark before it, you're yeah. about to get a good deal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so the whole 600 series. And I want to call out some things. Uh, I absolutely love that we allow and encourage customers mm -hmm. to upload photos of their products that they've bought and that they are using. Uh, and I want to call out two of them specifically. Uh, so let's go take a look here at the reviews on the 606 S2. And uh, we have you know quite a few, 51 customer reviews, averaging five out of five stars. <laughs> Uh, but people are uploading photos of where they're installing them and putting them at their house. I mean, that's a good looking yeah. speaker, right? Yeah, and you definitely want stands for those. For sure, yeah. and they are, and you can get some nice matching stands. Mm -hmm. Those will be listed in the accessories for the speakers. Uh, the other one I wanted to show was on the center channel speaker, uh, the 600 as well, which is the HTM S2. That'll be down the page a little ways. Uh, there it is right there. Uh, this is my favorite. Um, I've, uh, I was excited to go live today so that I could show <laughs> this picture on live. Oh my gosh, that's not the same picture. Maybe I need to go to the black version of the speaker. This is a totally different <laughs> customer review uh, with, uh, with some, looks like some 6.2 bookshelves and the center channel. That's great. Uh, let's go back and look at the black version of that same speaker. I think that's where we'll get the picture I saw the other day that really made me happy. Let's, yeah, let's try that one. Survey set. This is the one. <laughs> this is uh, just stare at this picture for a little while. Just take it in, soak it all in. I'm gonna go check and see if we have any YouTube comments coming in while you're looking at this right. picture, because it just makes me happy to see. I want a room like this in my house for sure. Um, so we do have a comment. Nothing to do with Bowers and Wilkins, but uh, Kilbert Herrera says Audio Frog GB60s. Are you familiar with Audio Frog? You're not a car guy, really, no. right? No. You're a home guy, so. Uh, Audio Frog is a company that makes, uh, it's by installers, for installers, uh, really custom sort of uniquely designed speakers that are installer friendly, uh, high performance speakers that just absolutely sound amazing. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, shout out to the Audio Frog GB60s. Uh, if, uh, if you have any questions about putting them in your car, Kilbert, definitely get in touch with one of our advisors. Um, so there you go. Um, 
Have you taken all in all there is to take in on this picture? Uh, because I don't know. I don't know. I can't even really. I, I like that there's two TVs yeah. next to say, the TV. That's your March Madness setup, right? Right. There. Multiple yeah. <laughs> games, multiple things at the yeah. same time. I think what I'm seeing here is maybe there's a couch in front of this table. So if you want to sit and eat dinner at a table or sit in a couch, either way, you're facing yeah. right the right way in your home theater. And uh, I mean, the statues and the posters yeah. and the, 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 I mean, this is just fantastic. So please keep uploading pictures mm -hmm. in your reviews. Uh, the, the more pictures like this, the more, we, we look at them here at Crutchfield. We look at them when oh, we're yeah. doing training. Mm -hmm. We wanna see, as we're talking with our new advisors, when, uh, when our customers are installing this stuff, how are they doing it? What does yeah. it look like? To see the end result of our work, you know, we're sitting here in a call center. Mm -hmm. uh, you're writing catalogs from your home, right? You don't often get to see the end right. result in a customer's home. And so these pictures coming in, it just, it really makes my heart sing. Yeah. Everybody's room is different, and our advisors will probably ask you that question. What's your room like? Absolutely. It's important. Yeah, so you should find, if you're talking to our advisors, uh, a very personalized recommendation. Mm -hmm. They will ask you a lot of questions yeah. because that's how they do their job, is to, is to find the right stuff for you. So um, I, think we're, I think we're ready to wrap this thing up, yeah. Eric. What do you think? Yeah. Um, you mind if I kick you out and bring in a special guest it here to say goodbye me. with me? I think that's a good idea, actually. Hey, Allison and Leah, come over here. Come say hi to Grandpa. My daughter and my granddaughter just stopped in to see Grandpa at work today, and uh, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to show you the two most beautiful people on the planet. Hey, baby, how are you? Hi, this is Aaliyah. Look, can you see you on the picture on the TV? Can you say hi, everybody? <laughs> She's a little shy, and she gets that from her mom. How you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> You guys having a good day out on out in the town today? Yes, we had a great day. We just went to the park. Went to the park? What'd you do at the park? Did you go down the slide? He made friends and everything. You made friends? <laughs> Did you swing on the swing? Nice. You didn't swing on the swing today? No? Did you say hi to Scherzer when you came here? Scherzer's my dog. He's been sitting around and walking around the training, the uh, video studio here the whole time. He's been good today. He was quiet and uh, didn't didn't bark or growl at anybody. Did you pet Scherzer? She's you want to? Okay, look right now. there at that camera and say goodbye. Can you say goodbye? No, we're not going to say goodbye. This is Aaliyah. This is my granddaughter. This is Allison. Thanks for stopping in. Everybody, thanks at home for watching. Thanks for all of those that commented today. Anthony Mercer, I think you get most uh, the award for most comments today uh, with another thumbs up. Thanks again for watching. Everybody behind the scenes, Ned and Zach, to River for coming in, uh, Eric for joining us last minute to share with us some Bowers and Wilkins uh, love. Uh, I'm JR. We're signing off. We'll see you in two weeks. Good job. <laughs> Give me five. Clock in the morning, dear. Been up for hours, it seems. Just about my time to go. Head on back to reality. Yes, it's time.